What's up everybody? Welcome back to story time. So, um, story time. I'm a terrible person. Learn from my mistakes. Quit talking shit. Amen, brother. Hell yeah, brother. Right tail person. So anyway, if you haven't seen the other two previous episodes, I encourage you to go ahead and watch them. Uh, links in the description below. So go ahead and go watch the other videos real quick and I'll, I'll wait. Alright, so welcome back, and since you've already caught up on the other videos, like I know you have, you already know about uh, when we infiltrated a white supremacist group. My neighbor decided to go burn a cross. I told him to put it in the street, which got me guilty, because even if you're trying to keep someone from making a terrible mistake, you still make them make a mistake, and if you don't call the cops, then you get in trouble. But if you do call the cops, then you're a snitch, and the neighbor kills you. Yeah, I was kind of between a rock and a hard place, in my opinion. For the record, this is root beer. I don't really drink alcohol, especially That's whiskey! Whiskey. Thank you. Everybody say hi to Anna. Hi. Anna's behind the camera. I'm tired. Once again, it is late at night. It's like 11.30, so I apologize if I blink a lot. My eyes get dry. Lights, heat, everything else. I'm having to do this where we normally record music and stuff. The other studio is not ready yet. So anyway, picking up where I left off on the last video. Talked about how I went and turned myself into the FBI headquarters in Nashville, Tennessee. So while I'm in the holding cell, they end up, they're like, I guess you want to, uh, we need to appoint you a lawyer or something like that. I'm like, sure. They get what's called a panel lawyer, which is basically if all the public defenders are being used, or in this case, the public defender was being used by the co-conspirators. They give you a panel lawyer. It's basically a, another attorney that stays on a panel of people they could choose from in the case that the public defender is not available. So anyway, I talked to him, let him know a brief description of what happened. He said, here's the thing, we'll figure out all the details later, but for now, when you go before the judge, we're just gonna say not guilty. They'll probably give you some sort of supervised release. It's kinda like being on probation. And then you're on that until your court date. I'm like, cool. So anyway, as I'm sitting in the holding cell, eventually uh, the FBI agents uh, come and get me and take me into a courtroom where my mom is sitting there. She freaks out because I walk in and I've got shackles on my legs and everything. And she's like, really like i can see her mouthing she's like you turned yourself in and i'm like i know we literally drove like six hours to get here to turn myself in and they're gonna put leg shackles on me like i'm all of a sudden gonna decide to run now so we go in and um the judge real nice lady she's like so do you understand all the charges and blah 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 i'm like yes ma'am or yes your honor or whatever and they're like how do you plea i'm like not guilty and then they're like okay um you're not a flight risk uh, for your pretrial supervision. You'll be assigned a probation officer, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can't leave the area. So then they're sitting there trying to figure out what counties and make sure I can still go visit my parents and things like that. So we figure all that out. One of the conditions was they were like, all right, well, apparently alcohol was involved. So my lawyer leans over to me and he's like, hey, can, because uh, this could take a year. Do you think you could go this whole time without drinking? And I'm like, yeah, like I really don't drink that much. And he's like, cool. And so he's like, Your Honor, I would like to say that, you know, my, my client agrees that he would be happy to agree not to drink. It was, it was a thing to make sure he's not going to mess up again during this time, which I held up to it. I went, it was like a, a year or so. I didn't drink any alcohol or anything like that. It wasn't that big of a deal. No drugs, no alcohol. You know, I'd go in um, every month or so for testing and stuff like that. And it wasn't a big deal to me. This just showed them that I was making an effort, that I was not some drunk, and that, in fact, alcohol really was you know part of the reason that night that i ended up in the situation i was in which on in reality like i still feel like i probably wouldn't have sat and called the cops even if i wasn't drunk but i do believe alcohol contributed to the other guys doing what they did so maybe if i hadn't been drinking it would have helped i i don't really know but anyway so uh so the judge ends up letting me go we drive back to mississippi after we go hit the town in nashville Come back to Mississippi later on, end up setting up with the probation officer. He comes and visits the house. I end up getting a court date scheduled. So months go by, you know, nothing, nothing unusual, just regular do the probation thing. I'm working, I'm doing all that. Time was coming up for the trial, and of course I'm freaking out. I'm like, oh crap, you know, I gotta go see the real judge now and figure out what they're gonna sentence me to, and yada yada. Throughout all this, you know, I'm talking to my lawyer, talking to the feds. They did uh, what's called a proffer at one point. Basically, a proffer is they see if you have any information, any information that could be helpful or useful to the FBI. And, and in return, they give you a reduced sentence, which I was like, all right, but I don't know what I'm going to tell them. And I get in there and they ask me a bunch of stuff about the time when my friends and I had gone and infiltrated the white supremacist group. They were like, okay, well, you know, what kind of drugs did you see? What kind of illegal weapons did you see? 
you know, we know they're doing this and that. And I'm like, well, they're not. So that was pretty much a waste of time because I didn't have anything good to tell them. I, I really didn't. I didn't know about any secret things going on or transportation of firearms or drugs or anything. So that was pretty much useless. Uh, that was a that was a wasted trip. But talking with my lawyer, basically what they what they did is they they wanted to he wanted to see, you know, number one what you want to plead to because the way they do it they give you like multiple charges because they want you to plead to something less so you don't have to actually go to a court court about it. That way it's just you talking to the judge and he determines your sentence. The way they did this with me was by giving me three counts. They gave me the 10 year mandatory minimum for conspiracy felony use of fire. They gave me like a, a zero to five year conspiracy to violate housing rights and then it's like zero to five year conspiracy to infringe on housing rights. Housing rights basically, the infringement of housing rights is saying that you infringed on someone's ability to live life unobstructed and comfortable, unthreatened in their home. Okay, so it was a threatening act, therefore you violated housing rights. I understood that one. The felony use of fire one with the 10 year mandatory minimum, even for a conspiracy, literally meant that if I went to court, because I was like, I'm willing to go to court over this, like I will fight this, they'll see that I didn't have involvement, like you know the feds are trying to say I did, and maybe I'll get off with some probation, maybe a little bit of time, I'm willing to do that. And then that's when my lawyer explained to me what a mandatory minimum was. So basically a mandatory minimum means if they can in any way, shape, or form prove that you had knowledge of the event, okay, under a conspiracy mandatory minimum. If they can prove that you had any type of knowledge of the event, you are therefore guilty and the mandatory minimum will be pushed against you. All they would have to prove is that I knew fire was involved and that it resulted in a felony charge. That's conspiracy, felony use of fire. I would have got 10 years. So if we went before a jury and they said, well, did you know that they lit this thing on fire? And I said, yes, automatic 10 year prison sentence. Now, of course, the feds know you're not going to plead to that. So what do you do? You plead to the lesser two. They say, oh yeah, yeah. If, if you'll plead to these lesser two, we'll drop the big one. And I'm like, well, of course you will. All that conspires through this, you know, this amount of time waiting to go to court. So I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly how all the plea things went in between all this. There was a lot of back and forth, but I know when it came to the trial date, We'd already said we would plead to the lesser two and blah, blah, blah. So the feds had agreed to that. So one of the things I did leading up to, uh, to the court date was, you know, my attorney said, Hey, if you got any letters of recommendations to the judge from people. So of course I had friends and business people, of course, some of the, the local millionaires and things that I had done work for and charity events for. I was on, on multiple charity boards and stuff in town. I did a lot of volunteer work prior to all this. So, you know, all those people wrote recommendations. Hey, look, you know, Tim's not out here doing drugs, doing illegal stuff. He's literally like volunteering all his time to help local charity events and kids and stuff like that. The local theater. I had a lot of involvement in these things that were, you know, were strictly voluntary and uh, not really beneficial to me, but just beneficial to society and the community, which is something I've always done. So I would, you know, like to thank in part all the people that wrote those letters and everything. So anyway, the, um, the court date comes. Of course, I've been freaking out for months about this. The good thing is, even if they find you guilty, they don't take you right away. Um, you know, you can do the self-surrender type thing. So I had that little reassurance that if they did try to make me go to prison, that I might have a little time to figure things out. I don't remember exactly what month or anything this was. I feel like it was in the fall. So we go to the court hearing, judge comes in and everything. And I had my birth mom there and some of the guys that worked for me there. Some of the people we'd taken care of over the years were there. And then of course you got to, got to feds and everybody over there. So it was funny, the, uh, actually when I first walked up, the first thing the judge did was he looked at me and he was like, and he said my name, he was like, you're not exactly what I, uh, what I imagined. I'm like, no, sir. He looked at the feds. He's like, he's like, I don't know, not to stereotype, but you're know, stereotypical, you know, some sort of white supremacist here, and you don't seem to really fit the bill. And, and I was some like, scrawny ass little boy. <laughs> yeah, some 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 scrawny ass little tan guy standing there. And uh, oh, I had I had like highlight. I think I had a blonde streak in my hair at the time or no, something. No, you didn't. Oh yeah, yeah. No, you didn't. Yeah. I did too. My mom had my mom had a blonde streak. I blonde, it was funny. No. Like it was great. You know, I show up with a bunch of guys with like blonde hair and stuff. We're preppy no. looking. When he stood up, the feds are all like, they didn't play for that one. So the judge, you know, asked who's with me. So, you know, my, my birth mom and the guys and the guys, you know, that worked with me and everything, you know, they all said how, you know, I'd given them a place to stay and I'd given them employment. My gay friend that was 
very flamboyant, was happy to tell the judge, Tim is my friend and he's always stood up for me and he's kept me employed and blah, blah, blah. I do interior decorating. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. But it's funny because the feds really, they looked over and were like, like they didn't plan for that. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't hate everyone like you think I do. So anyway, so um, after the judge meets the people that are with me and uh, talks to me and I gave an initial statement. I figure what they called it. You're sorry for what happened and that, that this is not the type of person you are. This does not define you, blah, 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 blah. You know, just letting them know like, hey, this, it was not my idea, but I do accept the fact that I was there. I'm not going to deny that I wasn't there. I will accept full responsibility, which I did. I mean, I did. He apparently had been reading the letters and stuff like that, and he reviewed some of them while we were there. And one of the things, you know, that they go through is, because again, they're try trying to establish, because they want to punish you based on your views. That's, that's honestly what it amounts to. They want to punish you based on your views. And honestly, some of these people the, the feds had with them were extremists from the the leftist side. You know, basically they, they wanted to send me away for 20 years and give me 10 years probation and all this kind of stuff. They really wanted to make me out to be something I wasn't. And fortunately, because the letters that went to the judge, you know, from people that used to work for me and, uh, you know, people of all different backgrounds and colors, races, genders, and, you know, things like that. The judge got to see, you know, how people actually view me and the fact that all my life I contributed back to the community and things like that not as a way to get out of any trouble but really just because that's the kind of stuff i did and some of the stuff you know he, he looked over past committees i was on i was actually on a committee back years and years uh before that for a hiv and aids awareness campaign and we raised money to help spread awareness and help research and uh, you know we donated to research foundations for hiv and aids which was mainly made up of the lgbt community and the black and latino community and so one of the things was like, wait, so back, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you were, you were on a committee, this large committee for this organization that held events and galas and stuff to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to help HIV and AIDS for minorities. And I'm like, yeah. And of course the feds are over there whispering to each other like, oh, you know, we, yeah, they didn't know about that. The judge is like, well. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't seem to match the profile they were trying to give you. And I'm like, yeah, I know, I, I goofed up one time. So, sorry. And then um, it brought up the fact that during that time, I also actually was in a gay pride parade with some friends of mine. And again, that was, <laughs> Anna's laughing. <laughs> I know, I know, I don't make, I don't make a good like racist hate person. No, you make a very good gay person. Though. I make a very good gay person. But I did, like, we made a float, and I was in there with my friends, and it was a really a lot of fun. Let me tell you, if you've never gone to a gay pride parade, you might as well go, because it was actually, it was a lot of fun. A lot of colorful people. Well, yeah, it's your people. Those guys know how to party. Just saying. Gay they people know how to do. get down. I need to take I, Anna to a gay bar. She doesn't understand that. I would panic. We at least need to take you to a, uh, to a drag show sometime. Have you ever I been to a drag show? Drag shows are great. I'd, I'd have an anxiety attack. Okay. I, would, I would freak out. Yeah, that helped too because like I had people I don't know if they end up writing letters or not but I did have like some of my references were like some of my drag queen friends and stuff like that so it was kind of funny <laughs> when some of your best friends are black drag queens then it kind of makes it hard to act like you're a racist hater so it, true story but anyway so you read about these the gay pride rallies I had taken place at with my friends uh, to to help them gain equality. I like the fact I mentioned in my earlier video, um, when I had my club, my, uh, my my personal like bodyguard guy, that like he would drive me around and he would go to things with me and I'd take him to dinner every night. And he was my security, my bodyguard, the whole time I had my business of running my, my club and music venue. He was a black guy, one of my best friends. The fact that during high school, my friend Charlie, who I mentioned in the first video, Unfortunately, Charlie passed away before the trial. So he, otherwise he would have been happy to have been there defending me and let them know, hey, you know, don't listen to what these feds are painting for you. Yeah, Tim will get himself into some stupid crap, but he's not the person you're trying to make him out to be. But they did have a lot of letters from my friends who I had employed and stuff like that. And of course he read about, you know, where one of my friends had stated the fact of, about me having, you know, a bunch of uh, my Mexican friends at my wedding and my black friends and everybody. So it really kind of made it hard for the feds to sit here and pin me as just some crazy extremist hate group guy when I had such a diversity of people in, in my background and, and them. Of course it helped too when my birth mom had, had wrote, you know, stating the fact that my biological father is half black. So that actually helped. That probably helped a lot because it's, it's hard to pin racism on somebody who's not pure or whatever you want to call it. Which besides the point, you know, there are mixed people, there are black people that could be racist against other black people, I guess. 
But it was just to show that, hey, it's not like I'm some, what do they call them when you're really white? Super white. <laughs> pure white? Like pure? There's an A word? Or what is it they call people that are really white? A lot of white. A lot of white. They had a word for it. But anyway, um, yeah, it was just hard for them to prove that I was just some sort of extreme guy that hated everyone. And, um, and that was proven instead of by the feds, that was proven by people who knew me, people from my past, people who I had employed, people who I had stuck up for, people who I had gone to parties with and marches and done charity events with and gone to their drag shows and things like that. I mean, you know, it, it just helped paint a better picture of me and the fact that obviously I was somewhere I shouldn't have been and got involved in something I shouldn't have been involved with. And I was, I was sorry about it and I was willing to admit that I was wrong and serve whatever time he felt necessary but i just wanted to make sure he knew the real me because as many of you know or as many of you have seen on tv and videos here especially over the past few years how the cops and uh, brutality against certain people i mean it's obviously things are a little skewed uh news is very skewed police reports tend to be skewed so sometimes you really got to hear it from from the people themselves so anyway after the judge got done um reviewing some of my references and asking me about that you know getting a little more information here and there you know then he looked at the agents and was like what do you believe you know we should do and of course they're like oh we want this many years in prison we want this many years in uh of probation and things like that and he looked at me he was like do you really feel like he deserves that he was like this gentleman has uh obviously always contributed uh positively to society he's never been in any trouble i've never spent one night in jail before that you know, he's like, are you, you sure you think you're being just with your recommended punishment? Of course, they're, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He needs to be put away forever, blah, blah, blah. And the judge looked at me, and he was like, well, what do you think we should do? And I was like, you've heard my statement. You've read all my stuff. I, I don't know. I was like, obviously, I would rather not go to prison. And he said, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to give you five years. I'm not going to give you ten years. But I do need to make a statement that people can't just get away with doing the stuff he said especially right now in this time that we're in he said we have to we have to make a little bit of a statement we have to set examples he said and if i just let you go free then that means other people could do similar and you know know about things happening and not tell the authorities and feel like there's no punishment for that so we have to set a little bit of example of you but i'm not going to make a major one and i was like okay your honor he said he said i'm, I'm going to sentence you to nine months in a federal institution and one year probation and when he did this the feds were going crazy they uh, with their little lawyer people and everything they were you know your honor your honor your honor no he needs more and uh he's like excuse me and they were like no um you know he needs more than that your honor he needs you know he's five years and blah 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 and the first time this is the first time i'd ever seen a judge do this but he literally put his finger at them and was like stop and they kept going and he said i said shut up and i was like but he said, you know, give me, give me a good reason other than this one incident that he should serve more than what I'm recommending. And they said, well, your honor, because he could do this again. And he looked at me and he goes, are you going to do it again? And I was like, no, sir. He said, and uh, if I put you on supervised release until time to self-surrender, will you uh, remain free from any alcohol or drugs? Because I see here that you have not drank in the past year. And I said, I said, no problem at all, Your Honor. And he looked at them and he said, that's good enough for me. And they were still fussing and he, he I mean, he, he fussed at them and uh, yeah, he told them once again, he was like, shut up, this is my ruling. They were very upset, but it was kind of funny to me because they really were, oh, well, you should get this, you should get that, he should blah, blah, blah. And the judge is like, no, he's like, he hasn't ever done anything, he's never been arrested. He had one mess up, I don't expect to ever see you in here again. I'm like, no, sir. And that was pretty much the end of that. All right, so uh, that concludes this part in the series of Storytime, My Prison Past. And next video, I will, um, let's see. And in my next video, um, I'll tell you about when I had to self-surrender myself to, uh, to federal prison. And uh, tell you a little bit about how that all worked. It was pretty interesting stuff. Thank you for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified of future videos so that you can hear my next story. And also stay tuned throughout the week as I will publish my vlogs in between story time. Thanks for watching, guys and girls, and I will see you next time.